Welcome to the AIER Standard, a production of the American Institute for Economic Research. I'm Ethan Yang. The Supreme Court recently concluded a roller coaster ride of a term, ruling on hot button issues such as federal a federal right to abortion, gun rights. While these are although these are consequential decisions in their own right, coming in at third place was a less talked about decision known as West Virginia v. EPA, which checked the agency's ability to regulate CO2 emissions without explicitly con- without explicit congressional authorization. By no exaggeration, this may change the way our fourth branch of government, the administrative state, operates in its ability to regulate social and economic life. For many, this decision represents a win for those that value economic freedom and constitutional limits on government power. Joining us today is Todd Gaziano, Chief of Legal Policy and Strategic Research at the Pacific Legal Foundation, and he is joining me in their, in their D.C. office. With 14 Supreme Court victories and counting, PLF is one of the nation's foremost public interest law firms specializing in constitutional rights and economic freedom. Todd is a veteran in the classical liberal movement, having ex- attended the University of Chicago Law School, where he was a John M. Owen Fellow in Law and Economics. He clerked in the U.S. Fifth Circuit Judge for Judge Edith Jones, served in the U.S. DOJ's Office of Legal Counsel as, as a Chief Subcommittee Counsel in the U.S. House of Representatives, and as the founding director of Heritage Foundation's Legal Studies Center. He's also a six-year term. He also served a six-year term as commissioner on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Mr. Gaziano has published countless op-eds and scholarly articles, several of which have gone on to influence Supreme Court litigation, congressional policy, and presidential actions. Todd, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, um, you didn't need to give quite as long a lead in. <laughs> my background uh, makes me sound um, older than I am, but I'm probably getting up there. Well, just a little bit about yourself. So you are here at PLF. You went to the University of Chicago. You had a long career in the so-called liberty movement. Um, did you ever partake in the, the corporate law life before getting into this space? For one year, but that was a family business. My, mm. my, uh, I was at a before that. I uh, between my judicial clerkship on the Fifth Circuit in Houston, and working in the Office of Legal. Uh, counsel in the Justice Department, I spent three years in a big corporate law firm. Mm. Um, so I certainly represented corporations. But then um, more recently, about eight years ago, uh, my brother and his wife have a um, healthcare IT business, and they twisted my arm to help work with them for a year. And I certainly learned an awful lot. Um, and so that was very exciting, but I missed the public interest law movement. And uh, as I sort of predicted with them at the time, um, I went, moved back here uh, to the DC area. And that's when I joined Pacific Legal Foundation. And I've always admired Pacific Legal Foundation uh, in my you know 15 years at Heritage, helping to coordinate other public interest legal organizations, always admired Pacific Legal Foundation, but I think we're doing some particularly exciting things right now. As you mentioned, we are accelerating our Supreme Court wins, and we have two more cases that will be argued before the Supreme Court in the coming term. Mm. Uh, The very first case the Supreme Court will hear is a return of Sackett versus EPA. It will be Sackett 2. And I know we're going to win, and it's going to be an (laughs) even bigger win. uh, I guess the PLF. quick um, quick brief for the audience who may not be aware of, what is Sackett 1 and then what would Sackett 2 be about? I uh, don't want to go off. You can stop me if I digress too mm-hmm. much because I want to get back to West Virginia versus EPA. I want to correct you. It was the most important case mm. <laughs> of the term. Um, but I, I have to digress on behalf of Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, Sackett, uh, the first time we went to the Supreme Court, um, the, the the underlying dispute is the same. Our clients were building a house two blocks from a lake in Idaho, and it wasn't lakefront, it was further back. And the EPA issued an order that their building lot was a, was a wetland and mm-hmm. uh, regular, regulable under their power over navigable waters. Well, you can't row a canoe on their mm-hmm. home site. <laughs> and, but the first time to the Supreme Court was just whether we had the right to go to court to challenge EPA's jurisdiction. And we lost in every court beforehand, and we had lost on that issue in every other court. But by the time we got to the Supreme Court, we had lost under 27 judges to zero. Hmm. So on that issue, not just PLF, but 
PLF and, and, and others had lost. Zero to 27, we won 9-0. Mm. But when we won 9-0, it was just the right to litigate in court about mm. whether EPA was right. Mm -hmm. So we went back to the federal district court, and the judge sat on the opinion for a very long time and uh, deferred to EPA on its regulation that um, they had jurisdiction, uh, their jurisdiction over navigable waters gave them jurisdiction over our clients' um, non-wetland mm -hmm. <laughs> product. So we went to the Ninth Circuit, and as some of your listeners may know, the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is a oft-reversed uh, court, um, a little less so with some newer appointees, uh, but we lost there too, and we went back to the Supreme Court. And we're, I, I have to say, I think we, PLF should all, should always win, but mm -hmm. I'm more confident than I normally am that we will win. And in part because the United States' brief in response is very weak, is mm -hmm. very defensive. And, uh, you know, they are continuing to try to assert EPA's jurisdiction over anything that might conceivably be, they say that the wetland is actually across the street, mm -hmm. 30 feet across the street and, and a ditch from our client's property. And somehow water seeps under the road and that gives them jurisdiction. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. The United States is going to lose mm -hmm. and Pacific Legal Foundation and our clients, the Sacketts, are going to help put limits on EPA's power under the Clean Water Act. Mm, and this is Justice Scalia's uh, land is water fallacy, essentially what the EPA is doing, trying to classify dry land as essentially water and trying to regulate it. Um, I guess super quickly before we dive into uh, the the West Virginia case, uh, so I'm sure most of our listeners understand generally like the whole uh, liberty space litigation, that issue, but I'm sure they're thinking like PLF, the law firm, like this, but this, I'm sure you can, I'm sure you can explain very well. This is not just any law firm. This is not Jones Day. This is not scatting. You know, we don't bill millions of dollars, right? So we do something uh, quite special. We as in, I'm saying we because I currently clerk here. So I guess uh, conflict of interest, but anyways, uh, so what exactly makes PLF special? What makes it a public interest law firm? Well, there are a number of, uh, we think we're the best, but there's a number of us that we we admire as well um, in that we don't, the, the, the most important, we don't charge clients a penny. Mm. So we are funded entire, and uh, like some others and unlike some, we don't take any government money either. We're, uh, unless we win it in legal fees after beating the government, we almost exclusively sue the government on behalf of private clients whose rights have been um, infringed or violated. Um, and uh, we sue almost exclusively to redress, you know, government abuse. Uh, we have our, you know, focus issues, and um, but we don't charge our, our clients a penny. So when hmm. we accept a case, um, we sometimes take over cases that have already been filed, and we sometimes file original cases on behalf of our clients. But we don't charge them a penny. All of our work is supported by private donations. Um, most of it is from individual small donors, 8,000 or so of them. Um, and then we have some uh, nice uh, uh, charities that also mm. support our our work because they believe in the issues that we follow and the work that we do. Mm. So this is a law firm dedicated to the little guy, you know, who uh, is getting prosecuted by the EPA, harassed by government agencies, and doesn't have the resources to fight. Basically, an institution funded by infinite amounts of money. Um, we help those uh, PLF helps those guys out instead of uh, maybe your traditional law firm where you know you're charging thousands of dollars an hour for corporate corporate mergers or whatever. Um, this is a firm that's dedicated to advancing certain types of issues, be it constitutional issues, economic freedom, and that sorts of stuff. Uh, exactly. Yes. I mean, I was proud of my work at the big law firm, too, because, you know, everyone deserves a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, corporations are screwed by the government, too, mm -hmm. and they deserve representation, but they can hire the big guys. And then sometimes corporations need to sue each other. Mm -hmm. But we don't do that. So at Pacific Legal Foundation, we don't engage in, you know, private versus private party versus private party. Um, so it, you know, it's good that the big law firms are there for that. Um, but uh, we, as you say, do represent uh, 
you know, tends to be smaller uh, parties who can't afford uh, 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 an expensive law firm. Um, when the government uh, violates or infringes their rights. Hmm. And it goes without saying with 14 Supreme Court victories and, you know, heavy hitters on the staff, plenty of publications is not just a law firm, but maybe like an expository of knowledge of like ideas to change the world, ideas regarding liberty, constitutionalism, what have you. Um, so to jump right into it, if you Google West Virginia e free EPA right now, one of the first articles that comes up would say uh, it's limiting our ability to fight climate change. Uh, this is, um, you know, anti-environmentalism at its finest. So I guess super quickly, it has the after WV v EPA has the conservative wing of the Supreme Court, quote unquote, stifled our nation's ability to fight climate change on behest of the coal industry. Is this what it's about? No. And that gives me an opportunity, not at all, but that gives me an opportunity to explain what the court hmm. ruling was about and what they said. And the entire ruling was whether EPA had been given the authority by Congress to issue a particular kind of regulation that would be more sweeping than it had ever issued before. But the issue that the Supreme Court looked at wasn't, well, this is more sweeping than you've ever issued before, and we have to decide whether we like it or not. No, the Supreme Court was saying, um, the nature of this particular regulation is this, does the agency have the power to issue this kind of regulation? And um, the court ultimately interpreting the law that, that granted EPA uh, power said, no, Congress, it's, it's, it's not plausible that Congress granted EPA this type of power. And, and I'll, it's, it's somewhat complicated, but I'll try to slightly oversimplify it. EPA in the past, and it does have specific power to require particular types of anti-pollution equipment or requirement or, or processes. So in the past, it, it could look at different you know, ways that coal-fired power plants operate, and it could say you have to put these kind of scrubbers on. You know, so it was given a certain amount of discretion by Congress to require certain types of pollution, or you need to eliminate these kind of really dangerous carcinogens. So, so, so in the past, that, that's the power it was given. Well, the regulation at issue in West Virginia versus EPA um, essentially would have gone beyond the what they say, the fence line of individual power plants and said, this is the, the, the type of, of uh, power that must be produced, which would have required a complete scaling back of certain types of energy production, mm. like coal, and ramping up you know, other types of... It, it was a industry-wide regulation that would have said what kind of power... Now, the Supreme Court ultimately held, no, the statute doesn't give the agency that type of, mm -hmm. of power uh, because under a doctrine known as the major question doctrine, Congress has to be really clear mm. when it gives the power of an agency to, um, uh, to regulate in, in a way that has a major economic, social, and political effect on hmm. uh, on the nation, and um, uh, but the final result, and this gets back maybe to your ultimate question, is uh, the court said nothing about whether Congress itself could make that regulation, and and the assumption is clear that Congress could require it, hmm. and even another view of the case is that perhaps Congress could have even delegated that mm. power to the agency to do so, but it hadn't. Mm. It hadn't done so. So I, I think there are limits, and there are certain justices of the Supreme Court that th think there are actual limits to whether Congress could have given that power or could still give that power to EPA. But none of us, none of us doubt that Congress can't do that mm. itself. Um, so, you know, did, did the court limit um, uh, United States, you know, power to regulate? No, not, not one bit. Mm. 
But what the Supreme Court did is reinforce the constitutional separation of powers. And this is why it's such an important decision. What the Supreme Court said is, um, you know, under Article One, Congress makes the laws. Hmm. Yeah, and I just before we move on, this is a very because the you know like all the op eds will say, you know, this is just like anti environmental decision, whatever. But what you won't see is what you just said is like this is basically it's not a decision about whether or not we need to address climate change or not, or whether or not the EPA should go after coal coal plants or whatever. This is mostly this is decision is fundamentally about. Did Congress actually authorize through the proper democratic channels the power for the EPA to make the decisions that it, that, that it made during with the Clean Power Plan? And the court's answer was no. There's nothing that Congress did. They, they passed the Clean Air Act, which has some provisions to go after pollution, but there's nothing in the Clean Air Act that actually authorizes the EPA to, to do what it tried to do um, in West Virginia v. EPA. Absolutely. And you hinted at your statement just a minute ago a couple other things. EPA still does have some power mm -hmm. to, to regulate. And the court said, we're not going, some people were critical of the Supreme Court decision for not saying exactly what power mm -hmm. the agency had. But that's not the Supreme Court's job. The Supreme Court is not allowed to give advisory opinions. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court's only power, or the federal court's only power is to decide actual cases and controversies. There was an actual case or controversy about a particular rule. The courts are not allowed to say exactly what power mm -hmm. the agencies have. So that criticism of West Virginia versus EPA, that they didn't say exactly what power EPA is, is, is a erroneous criticism. But the agency clearly does have some power, but now it has to be a little bit more careful. It has to be because it doesn't want to spend another couple of years and then be shot down. It has to be honest, mm. quite frankly. It has to be more honest about what power Congress Act, and has to be more careful to live within it. But that's the other reason why West Virginia versus EPA is such an important decision. It was the third of three decisions this term, but the most important one that expanded and defined this notion of the major question doctrine, mm. that, that Congress must be clear if it's giving a power that has a, such a significant economic political or other social effect. The other the other two decisions were a eviction moratorium uh, that the CDC mm -hmm. had, had issued. Without any congressional authority, I'm right. assuming. Right. Well, that was the question. They claimed that their power over this, that, and the other, and, you know, we're the CDC, and this is a pandemic, so mm -hmm. if we just cite pandemic and our authority <laughs> were pandemic, th this gives us powers to prevent eviction moratorium. Well, again, the court said, well, you do have certain powers. We know you have certain powers. Mm -hmm. Those aren't the ones you, <laughs> yeah. you, you have certain powers to do certain things, but that, that's not what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're preventing landlords from evicting tenants. That's a major, you know, and if you, we expect if Congress gave you that power it, to be, it would have been clear. And since it was not clear to give you that power, we, we interpret your, your, properly interpret your, your power not to do that. I mean, I guess to illustrate just how ridiculous that is, like the CDC making economic regulation about eviction moratoria would almost be like the equivalent of like the Department of Education doing counterterrorism or something like that. Is that a good analogy? That's a, that's a fair analogy. Yeah. And then the third case that was actually came in the middle uh, of these three was a, uh, a, a rule that required um, all large employers to vaccinate their employees, regardless of what you think of vaccination. I'm a pro-vaxxer, by the way. Mm. For the record, I was raised, my father's a pulmonologist, so I'm a vaccine <laughs> pusher. But I was against the mandate mm -hmm. because the you know agency did not have uh, uh, the, the the statutory power. So so this was West Virginia versus EPA was the third but clearest example. And um, it is a tool of statutory construction. And the here's an important phrase maybe for your listeners to think of. The court is says that it's suspicious and it may subject the agency's assertion of power when it is using a long extant statute for a new purpose um, that is arguably you know very different than it's ever mm -hmm. used before. And 
the question is, okay, 30 years ago, or in the case of the Clean Air Act, you know, you know, 40 some years ago when Congress passed the 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 Clean Air Act uh, and gave the agency specific powers, mm -hmm. specific powers to prevent certain toxins, to prevent you know, was that was it get really giving EPA at that time uh, the power to decide between how much energy is generated by gas and how much is generated mm -hmm. by wind and renewables and how much is generated by no mm -hmm. and it, it's just implausible that um, that that new power that EPA found mm -hmm. was just not plausibly. Uh, granted by Congress, and we're going to require Congress to be clear if it gives that type of that sweeping of power to an agency. So, mm -hmm. so, so Congress can Congress can always do it itself, and they're the lawmakers. Mm -hmm. And I guess to stress this, the reason why Congress didn't do it is either one, they didn't think about it, or two, they they can't agree upon it because you know the country we you know there's diverse political opinions. We elect our representatives, and the fact that. Uh, you won't get some sort of sweeping legislation is not necessarily because there's something wrong with Congress is that's because the country can't agree and therefore uh, administrative agencies just can't uh, just go around that and start shoving down an agenda be, be just because the president put some people in charge of the agency and now they're going to subvert Congress. And this is I don't I mean, this is why people were upset about Obama. This is why uh, there was a whole backlash and the Trump administration came in. So this is almost just like a i mean it is a subversion of democracy in, in the plainest terms um would you agree about that that's an excellent point but i'll go one step further <laughs> and my one step further is um yes you you can't say congress is broken just because it doesn't pass everything you personally like mm -hmm. you know democracy is about compromise and it's about consent building consensus but here's where i would go further when agencies assume power, mm. they make it less likely that Congress can agree mm. because there's no pressure on Congress to, you know, pass a particular type of legislation that directly regulates climate change because uh, the progressives who want a lot of regulation um, won't, aren't satisfied with the compromise that they might get in Congress, and they just ask the agency to act. And when the agency acts, that prevents any um, reason for Congress to act. There, by the way, most members of Congress um, also don't like to make hard decisions. Mm -hmm. They like to claim credit, but if they can dodge their responsibility to an executive branch agency, and then, by the way, wag their finger at them when, mm -hmm. they, when the agency doesn't uh, uh, do what they want, um, th they'll do that. Um, there's a scholar, David Schoenbrod, who wrote a book called Power Without Responsibility mm. about 25 years ago about that, about that tendency of Congress to let the agencies. So the court shouldn't let them. If the courts let the agencies do so, it's less likely <laughs> that mm -hmm. Congress will, 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 will act. So if we really care about democracy, and there's a lot of progressives who talk a good game <laughs> mm -hmm. about democracy, then we need to insist that our elected leaders make our laws. Mm -hmm. And we need to applaud the court when they call foul or they call BS on the agencies mm -hmm. who are trying to exercise power that they were never democratically given. Mm. And Let's, I want to zoom out a little bit because you did say this is an extremely, if not the important case for the term, this certainly changes everything. It's not just about the EPA, this is about the administrative state in general. So I actually want to quote you this, uh, you wrote an article in uh, Law and Liberty and the quote goes, Congress often does not decide sig significant policy questions when creating new regulatory programs and instead creates what Justice Antonin Scalia once described as junior varsity Congress to do the hard work does not prove that Congress can't do so. Pro Professor David Schoenbrod, among others, explained long ago why members of Congress prefer to shun the hard work and accountability for making tough policy calls while still taking credit for doing something by passing feel-good laws that delegate the real authority to regulatory agencies. Elected lawmakers will try to avoid accountability for making major policy calls as long as they can get away with it. Can um, So 
what what exactly were you trying to communicate there? Well, I I I hope I spoke pretty clearly on itself, but I will I- expand in two important ways. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that this isn't just about EPA. It's about a constitutional and statutory interpretation doctrine. And and that doctrine applies to all regulatory agencies. And the fact that West Virginia versus EPA was the third of the case this term to decide that rein, reinforces that. Um, and secondly, um, I think those people who are critical of it just aren't comfortable with the result that they're likely to get mm-hmm. in Congress. And one, um, to, to put their view sort of charitably, um, they may think that there's not enough, or that the lawmaking process is difficult. The lawmaking process, you know, there's the filibuster and, you know, what they want is less likely to be passed. But the framers understood that. And Justice Gorsuch has written several several good decisions in recent years about that. And he had a concurrence in West Virginia versus EPA that I would recommend um, to, to, to the listeners where he described the framers knew that legislation was difficult, but that was a feature of our mm-hmm. democracy rather than a bug. It's a feature because the policies that eventually come out, the legislation that eventually comes out um, is more sound. It's more stable. It's, it's, more subject to the consent of the governed. Mm. Um, it, 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 yes, it's it's more difficult, um, but the benefits are worth it. At least that's what the framers decided, and that's the constitution we have. Now, I think it's a great constitution. I think mm-hmm. they were right then, and 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 they're right now. We're right now to retain that. Um, but even if you are frustrated by the framers' design, you ought to understand um, that, you know, legislation's a a messy process, um, but, you know, the great legislative victories, the Civil Rights Act, you know, took, you know, many, many decades, but we have consensus on it now. We have consensus on it because it was eventually reached in a democratic process. We, you know, policies where we don't have consensus on are likely to flip-flop back and forth between different administrations. Mm. And so... When we say this changes everything, right? There's so many administrative agencies out there. I think there's, I mean, there's so many alphabet soup abbreviations like EPA, DOJ, DOE, IRS, right? So what are the implications? Like how much, when you say that now agencies need to follow the major questions doctrine and they need to fo- basically be more uh, honest about what con- what powers Congress actually delegated to them by passing legislation, uh, what part, like I guess in your view, for the administrative state, I think there's like, you know, like people, I remember Trump had a whole press press conference where he just showed like the massive boxes of, of papers, all filled with regulations. Like how, what does this do to the administrative state's ability uh, basically to enforce laws and go and enforce federal authority over uh, private citizens? Well, it ought not to affect their ability to enforce the actual authority mm. that, they, <laughs> that, 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 that they have. What it does is it, it, it limits their um, uh, extra, you know, I'm trying to think of the right the right term, but the word is is escaping me, um, the, the power that they want. You know, most bureaucracies are never satisfied with the power they have. And if Congress won't give them the power they desire, they just try to read that new power into the power. That, that's what will be... Um, that's what will be uh, limited. And I have to say that it's not just, uh, it's not a partisan tendency, but, you know, going, you know, back from Clinton administration through George W. Bush, Obama administration, they've all decided that if they get frustrated with Congress, they'll just use their pen and their phone was the, mm-hmm. the, the um, you know, Obama mm-hmm. era uh, way of talking about it. But but Trump did did some of the same um, the same thing. Uh, I'm not saying, by the way, that all executive orders are bad either. I There's a uh, written on that and there's a nice Federal Society video that your listeners can mm-hmm. can Google uh, where John, you and a few of us 
um, discuss what is the proper use of executive orders, what's not. But there was a tendency, I think, um, for activists to just ask the agencies to read read powers into their statute, mm-hmm. so it that that don't exist. And I think that's what's been significantly curtailed. Um, and the way I think I explained it a little bit earlier, um, agencies run a risk if they do that if they spend years because it takes years to develop major regulations. If they spend years developing a major regulation that really did exceed their powers, they're going to be clipped by the court and they have to mm-hmm. go back to ground zero. Um, and it might be a new administration by that point. Hmm. So when it comes to upholding the federal balance of power between uh, Congress, the courts, and the executive, how, mo- how disruptive do you think uh, the administrators say, I guess we'll find out you know, what's going to happen after, in the coming years when, after the major question doctrine. But prior to West Virginia v. EPA, a, a lot of people, especially people like Richard Epstein, uh, wrote a book just basically proclaiming that the whole entire premise of the administrative state is against the rule of law. So how disruptive do you think uh, the administrative state has been or could be uh, when it comes just to because during the founding, I, I think um, there are only a handful of agencies and not during the 20th century really ballooned into what it is now. So, like, how sustainable do you think that track would be to have uh, what essentially is this fourth branch of government? Well, there's two things I think was significantly transformed, mostly in the 20th century and then beyond. One that you point out was the sheer number of agencies grew. But the bigger problem was the unconstitutional mm. power many of them were given and the unconstitutional power many of them assumed, mm-hmm. just seized, that mm-hmm. the courts then allowed. Mm. So I think what we see is is primarily by the courts, the courts aren't aren't going to, you know, eliminate agencies, but what they're trying to do is strike down their unconstitutional powers. So... So these agencies can still perform a lot of vital tasks, um, but they have to do it in a democratically accountable way or a way that ensures due process of law. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, uh, it would be, you know, a, a terrible thought to some people, but I think, you know, all these agencies, they supposedly are, have all the expertise. Well, they can study things as much as Congress wants them to study. They can propose laws and they can use, and then it would be submitted to Congress for an up and down vote. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a version of a process, a bill that's called the Reins Act mm-hmm. that would would do this by law. But but there, you know, we don't even need a Reins Act for for it to operate. But if the agencies don't have a particular power, they can still study something that's you know within their jurisdiction. The president always has the constitutional power to recommend laws to Congress. It's in Article mm-hmm. 2. Yeah. And so the agencies that report to the president can study things. They can make recommendations to the president. So ultimately, um, there's, you know, the, the, these agencies, if you, by the way, I think sometimes they hide behind fake expertise mm-hmm. and they want us to, you know, not question their interpretation of science. They just yell science, 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 <laughs> mm-hmm. science, as if, you know, that answers all the policy, that answers all the science questions and all the policy questions. Mm-hmm. No, you know, some scientific questions are, are are subject to dispute. And more importantly, the policy that flows for them is not ac- automatic. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it'd be great if we all just stopped drinking tomorrow, but, you know, democratically, it's probably not, probably not going to happen and maybe cost benefit for society, not the best idea as well. Yeah, I like drinking, so <laughs> I'm not going to stop drinking. But um, I was talking to someone in, in our foundation on, a, on another issue um, about how some agencies, you know, their focus, the Consumer Product Safety Commission doesn't regulate bathtubs, but they sometimes... Uh, you know, will regulate something if there's, well, a lot of people die in bathtubs and sometimes the Consumer Product Safety Commission, this is a little off a tangent, says, well, if there's one death and and the product is unnecessary, we're going to to ban it. Well, bathtubs aren't, we could all shower. (laughs) Uh, We could all take sponge baths. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bathtubs aren't strictly, um, but, but what gives some regulator the power to decide 
whether something we enjoy that has some small danger is unnecessary or not. Mm -hmm. um, but when you create bureaucracies, they have tunnel vision mm -hmm. and they're myopic in, in their focus. But that's why we need democratic accountability for um, the ultimate decisions. Um, the, you know, people in a, in a whatever regulatory agency are going to think their agency is the most important thing in the entire world, mm -hmm. and that's what creates the the myopic vision over the importance of of what they do. Uh, that doesn't mean there's no value mm -hmm. to what they do. It just means that they don't have the proper perspective. And in a democracy, the we need to make sure there's democratic accountability at different levels for you know, policy. So if Congress makes the policy and the agency's really just enforcing it, that's fine. Um, but too much of the administrative state has been um, devoted to actually coming up with policy. What what you, you quoted my article quoting Scalia hmm. said that Congress created junior varsity Congresses hmm. <laughs> um, and, and, and just delegated, mm -hmm. you know, huge swaths of its legislative power. You know, it created the FCC and then just just delegated huge swaths of its power over the communications mm. industry. Well, some of that's unconstitutional. Some of that's unconstitutionally broad. And Congress needs to make those decisions or leave it to the market. Mm. And this is also a fundamental tension between some scientists at the FDA who says it's bad to drink, smoke, eat greasy food, and the American public that says that may that may be scientifically true, but I will enjoy my hamburgers and I'll enjoy my cigars. Thank you very much. Please do not take them from me. And this is the, the difference. And that's why, you know, the FDA can't just, well, I mean, they did just ban jewels, but I'm, I'm sure there's a whole legal minutiae behind that. But that's why they can't just go ahead and, and ban whatever they feel like, that they need to get congressional approval uh, before doing something, because that's what the people demand. And then the Agencies themselves are public servants, and they receive mandates. Not uh, they're not the masters of civilization. That's right. And one of the early uh, major question cases actually involved tobacco. Hmm. Yeah, the I mean, scope of the tobacco <laughs> uh, uh, regulation. Uh, so moving on, I remember I don't know if you were one of them, but I know a few pe a few scholars in this field were saying that West Virginia v. EPA uh, didn't go far enough. Right? There's other. I'm sure well, you have to explain for our audience, but there's bigger fish to fry, right? We have non-delegation doctrine. We have Chevron deference. These are, you know, these are the bigger fish to go after. So I guess, uh, can you explain what those two ideas are? And I guess your stance on did West Virginia v. EPA go far enough with just a non-delegation doctrine or should it have gone on to implement on uh, major questions doctrine or should it have gone on to create a non-delegation, reinvigorate non-delegation or abolish Chevron deference? I'll, I'll I'll try to answer some of those as succinctly as possible. Um, I think that West Virginia versus EPA was right as far as it went, but it would be bad if it prevented the court from making other changes to reform the administrative state and restore constitutional separation of powers. Uh, and there is a possibility hmm. that, of that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily prevent the court from taking a further step. So some people read it that way. I don't, but it would be bad if it did. And the non-delegation doctrine is the more important one, which says there are certain things that Congress must decide for itself mm. and it can't delegate to the executive or an agency, even if it's clear. Mm. So remember, the major question doctrine says Congress must at least be clear if it delegates. But the non-delegation doctrine goes further and says there are certain things that Congress must decide for itself, which is which is even more important. Um, it can allow agencies to fill in gaps, certain gaps, because no law Congress passes is going to be perfectly clear. No law Congress passes is going to decide every small issue. But if you're a law student, you may have heard the term interstitial gaps. Those are very small gaps. So, so those are the types of things that Congress can delegate uh, to the agencies. And it ought to be clear about them always. But even if it's not clear, the agencies can fill in these small gaps. Um, but there but there are, it, it cannot 
let's say, even if it's as clear as can be, it can't say, we are going to delegate all our power over labor to the labor department. Mm -hmm. Whatever power we have over labor laws, we're delegating to the labor department. And there are nine justices who actually agree on that principle. They disagree over what the test is. Mm. But I think there's now, or there seemed to be a couple years ago, a majority of the current court, and this was before um, uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett or Justice Jackson joined the court. So we don't know exactly where all the justices are, but there seemed to be a majority a few years ago to re-examine the line, the test, and the line to police the type of delegations Congress could make. Um, if you want me to go on, I can talk about Chevron deference too, since you're, is, would that be okay? Sure, of course. Um, it, it, th this is a misguided, made sense at the time to some people, but a misguided, misguided judicial judges deferring to regulatory agencies, including and especially on the interpretation of laws and regulations. And there are different justifications for having the courts defer. But it is ultimately the court's responsibility and duty mm -hmm. to independently say what the law means and not defer always to one side of the litigation, one side of the litigation being government. That's bias. That's mm -hmm. Judicial bias is the opposite of judicial independence and, and the judicial duty. So this would be like the legal equivalent of trust as science, I'm assuming. In a way, yes. It's trust the bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. Um, so trust the bureaucrats was, you know, the various arguments. Well, they're the experts is one of the reasons. Another reason is, uh, you know, judges should be modest and judges should be modest, but it's their job to decide what the law means. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so the major question doctrine that we're talking about in West Virginia versus EPA prevents the courts from deferring to the agencies on these major questions. Mm -hmm. But most of us think that they can't defer to regulatory agencies on any question of law, mm -hmm. whether it's major or minor. Mm -hmm. If it's a matter of interpreting the agency's own power, and there's a related doctrine, you know, related to Chevron, where the courts deferred to an agency's interpretation of its own power, mm -hmm. um, that makes no sense. So we want the the court ought to go further. It's not just whether I want it, that, that's the right result. The court ought to go further and admit its mistake in Chevron and in subsequent cases and these related areas and say, um, the major question doctrine is a tool we use to interpret a particular question, but we're never going to defer to the agency just because it's an agency. Mm -hmm. And in the agency's interpretation, can that change depending on who's president, who's in charge of the agency? Yes, and it does, and it flips back mm -hmm. and forth. There's this this uh, this this case, um, and for, for whatever, you may remind me, uh, Brand X, Brand X case, mm -hmm. um, where the court said, even if we, the court, have interpreted a statute to mean X, if an agency later says, no, it's not X, we must change our interpretation. Mm. Well, that's a pretty bizarre way for a court to operate. It's one thing to be respectful mm -hmm. to another branch, but it's the court's job to interpret law. And it's especially the court's job to be the final interpreter in court cases. You know, the executive might be the final interpreter in a matter that never goes to court. And this is this is a theory of uh, proper theory. Congress also should, you know, maybe the final interpreter of the Constitution if it decides not to enact a law. And no mm -hmm. one can ever say anything about that. If they said this law would be unconstitutional, we're not going to pass it. No one can make them, mm -hmm. and they would be fine. So there, there, there are situations where each branch is final, but a court is the final interpreter of law in court cases, mm. and it has the responsibility not to defer to the other branches. Its responsibility is to fairly, independently mm. interpret law. That is what they're 
their their job in, in, in our government is. And so it's, you know, in some ways I'm oversimplifying issues. Some of your listeners are probably, you know, very sophisticated and I apologize to them. Um, but my, my position would be the same. But I'm, 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 I, I actually think it's harder to justify the, 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 the argument on the other side. It's harder to justify why courts uh, should ever defer. You, can, you ought to be respectful to both parties. Um, if the agency has such expertise that it's persuasive, Mm -hmm. then fine. So that's how they can employ their expertise. Listen, we're the IRS. We know more about tax laws than anyone else. Fine. Mm -hmm. But if someone makes a convincing argument <laughs> on the other side, the court ought not to defer to the IRS just because they're the IRS. Mm -hmm. And the the uh, Chef with Chevron deference combined with the amount of delegation Congress is doing to administrative agencies, would you just say that, you know, you have your tripartite government, this finely balanced, finely tuned instrument. And in the introduction of the administrative state and how big it's gotten today, how much power it's sapping from every single branch, it's almost just like this massive black, like this huge weight that's, you know, slowly uh, displacing every other branch of government. Is that, do you think that's kind of like the trajectory it's been going? That was the trajectory, but mm -hmm. I think in the past few years, we're making great strides against it. And I think your, your point is absolutely right that these wrongheaded, tendencies were combining to make everything worse. So Congress had the tendency to delegate as much as possible to absolve itself of responsibility. Agencies were exercising the tendency to always expand their power and take those vague grants of power, some of which could never constitutionally have been given to them, and expand them. But then with judicial deference, like under Chevron, uh, they were then convincing the courts to uh, essentially defer and look the other way. Mm -hmm. So all of those doctrines were combining to increase the power of the regulatory state, to minimize the power of uh, and responsibility of Congress, and to minimize the authority and responsibility of the courts. But I do think that's changing. So in the last few years, and, you know, we at Pacific Legal Foundation, a big part of our focus the last few years is to restore the constitutional separation of powers, mm -hmm. restore the structural protections in the Constitution um, for liberty. And I think we and others are making great progress. Mm. So one final question to wrap up. Um, you've mentioned this changes everything. I'm, I believe it changes everything, I'm sure. Every, everyone around us can look at it. And even if you disagree with the decision, you would agree that this changes a lot of things. So what does this mean going forward for not just the state of our constitutional republic, but I guess for the, you know, the business owner, the, the small guy just listening to this with, you know, no attachment to the legal system. They're just, you know, they're a business owner, they own property, they're, um, you know, a student, what have you. What, do, what does this mean uh, for the average American citizen? It means a couple of things. Uh, it's a uh, a wide-ranging ending question, but I'll 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 be as I'll be relatively succinct. One thing is it means we need to elect different types of members of Congress hmm. and state legislators, and we need to call on them to exercise their responsibility. But I think it also means that we can sigh a little bit, have a little bit of relief that the unelected fourth branch of government. Is not going to continue to metastasize like a cancer. Hmm. Um, that there are people placing limits on it. And finally, I think it ought to give them hope that there's a trend in the courts. the The court's trend is not to rule against environmental, but to require Congress to do its job, mm -hmm. or to require um, it to do its job by interpreting things more carefully. So, I mean, I... I... Um, Chief of Legal Policy and Strategic, Strategic Research at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you very much again. If you liked what you heard today, make sure to check out all of AIER's various media channels, such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, as well as check out our website at AIER.org. If you really liked what you heard today and you want to support more cutting-edge research and discussions like this, make sure to become a donor. All that information and more can be found at AIER.org. Thank you. Mm -hmm.